All right, so hopefully by now you guys have grabbed the Unit 3 Reader from the bookstore. Um, and we're going to just dive in. So this unit, Unit 3, is all about energy. Um, and what we're going to be doing is taking the ideas that we've been building about attractions and motions and thinking about those things in terms of energy changes. Um, and so the first part of Unit 3 we'll be thinking about thermochemistry, which is all about heat transfer. And then the second part of Unit 3 is all about light energy and how we use light energy to study the structure of the atom. So um, this is kind of a, a picture of the big ideas for the unit. Um, what we're building up to is understanding potential energy and how it relates to attractions and repulsions. And we'll be thinking about how changes in potential energy or changes in bonding lead to changes in kinetic energy um, in the surroundings. So this might not yet make sense, but this will be kind of a, an overarching picture that you can come back to in the unit. And I wanted to point your attention to this page. It's called Summary of Enthalpy Considerations. Uh, there's a lot of different formulas in thermochem that students tend to feel kind of lost within. And so this for us is going to be our organizing document that's going to organize the big idea. And then every time we think through a new way of calculating heat exchange, we're going to fill in this table here. So I'll come back to this at the end of this lecture. Okay. So this is lecture 17, and it's called The Heat is on Heat Transfer. Um, and the key question for this unit is, you know, what is heat transfer? And why do some substances tend to take longer to heat up or increase their temperature than other substances? By the end of this lecture, what I'd like for you to be able to do is describe the difference between heat and temperature be able to um, talk about what heat transfer looks like at the atomic scale, so have a molecular level explanation. Um, be able to understand how temperature change relates to energy input, uh, mass of the material, and its specific heat. And then I would like for you to be able to describe the motions, molecular motions required to raise the temperature of a substance and to be able to tell what dictates the amount of energy um, that might be needed to raise the temperature. So again, hopefully all of these learning objectives will become more clear throughout the lecture. Um, yeah, we're going to start with the demo though, to start. So um, I'm going to read this. I want, I'm going to give you a little bit of space here to write your prediction and then leave a little bit of space for us to have some class notes. So let's switch over here. Okay, it looks like I cannot switch away from the document camera while this thing is recording, so I'm going to attempt to just record myself like this. And I'm sideways. Interesting. Oh, okay. Perfect. So I have two balloons. I have a, sorry, I have a balloon that's filled with water, and I have a balloon that's filled with air. And what I'd like you to do is um, think about what's going to happen when I place a flame underneath each balloon. So pause the video, take a moment to write your prediction. What's going to happen when I t put a burning match underneath each balloon. It's one filled with water and one filled with air. So hopefully you've paused, you've written what you've thought, now we're gonna see it happen. Woo! Okay, that was the balloon filled with air. And now we're gonna look at the balloon filled with water. I wish I had one of you to help me hold this got a bucket underneath just in case. So I'm putting the flame right up to the balloon. My hands are shaking a little bit. Ooh, 
and the match went out. So you can see there's a little bit of charring, but I can touch it and I don't feel any heat at all. There's no warmth to where the match was. And I actually could have kept this flame under here for a few minutes and nothing would have happened. Um, so the goal for our lecture today is to try to understand why is it that that air balloon popped and why is it that the balloon with water did not. So I'm going to take us back to the notes and figure this out. Okay. All right, so one thing when we're thinking about what happened. The balloon that was filled with the air, you might think that it popped because the gas inside it expanded too much for the balloon to handle, but that actually isn't the case. What happened is that the balloon that was filled with air popped because the rubber itself got too hot. It increased in temperature too much and it lost its integrity. There became basically a weak spot in the balloon and that's why the balloon popped. So you might want to note the balloon filled with air popped because the balloon itself increased in temperature. and the rubber lost integrity. Okay, so it's not because of expansion of gas. Um, and what happened with the water is that the balloon with the water did not increase in temperature at all, really. The balloon filled with water uh, did not increase in temperature. The rubber basically stayed room temperature. Okay, so one question that we're trying to answer in this lecture is, uh, why is it that some substances require more heat in order to change their temperature than other? So why is it that some substances require more energy input, or you could think of that as more heat transfer, to increase their temperature. And the answer to that lies partly in this idea of something called the specific heat capacity. Um, so experiments show that the heat absorbed by a system, let's say by copper or glass or water, um, and the corresponding temperature change that occurs because of that heat transfer are proportional. So what that means, heat is proportional to uh, the change in temp of the substance. And heat, the variable that we use to describe heat is Q. So essentially Q is proportional to, and I'm going to leave a little space, delta T. So how much heat, let's say I put in 0.38 joules of heat or 0.84 or 4.18 joules of heat, how much heat I put in is directly proportional to the change in temperature that occurs in each of these substances. Um, the constant of proportionality between Q and delta T is what we call the system's heat capacity. Okay, so I'm going to notate that with C. C is the variable for heat capacity. And there's two kinds or two sets of units for heat capacity that you'll need to know. Um, specific heat capacity
abbreviated C with a, a lower S. Um, what the specific heat capacity is, is it's the heat required to raise the temperature of one gram of a substance by one degree. So the heat required to increase the temperature, or it could be decrease as well, so just, I'm going to say to change the temperature. of one gram of a substance by one degree Celsius. So if you look here, if you want to change the temperature of one gram of copper, you have to put in only 0.38 joules of heat. If you want to change the temperature of water, you need to put in significantly more heat in order to change the temperature. And that is because the specific heat capacity of water is so much higher than for copper. The energy it takes to raise the temperature of one gram of water is so much more than for copper. Um, specific heat capacity is measured in grams. You also can have a molar heat capacity that's measured. The abbreviation for that is CP. And what molar heat capacity is, it's the heat required to change the temperature of one mole of a substance by one degree Celsius. So the only difference is that we're looking at how much heat would you have to transfer in to one mole of a substance versus one gram of a substance if you want to change the temperature of that substance. Okay, so if you were with me in class, we would conduct a few experiments. Um, I will Somehow, probably an announcement, send out the website you can use if you want to conduct these experiments yourself. But essentially what the simulation allows you to do is hold some fire underneath different materials. I have copper and water here. Um, and you can track how much heat you're transferring into the material, what is the mass of the material, what's the initial temperature, and after you put in 150 joules, let's say, of heat, what is the final temperature? Um, I'm going to fill this data in for us, and you might ask yourself, okay, copper versus water, look at their specific heats, 0.38 versus 4.2, what do you expect if you put the same amount of heat in, which do you expect to have a higher final temperature based on the specific heats? Maybe pause, take a moment to think about it, um, and here's the data. So. Five grams of copper started at 20 degrees. When you put 150 joules of heat, transferred that into the copper, the final temperature of the copper is 98 degrees Celsius. So you can imagine it's almost like burning a flame under copper for three seconds. Whereas water, if you had five grams of water, you start at 20 degrees, the final temperature is only about 27.2 degrees Celsius. So wildly different result. And the explanation, you know, is right here in specific heat. This specific heat is something like 12 times bigger than the specific heat of copper. So you have to put in significantly more energy into the water to raise its temperature by one degree Celsius for every gram you have. So it's going to the, the water is basically going to warm up much slower than the copper is when you're putting in the same amount of heat. Here the temperature changed 78 degrees Celsius and here the temperature changed only 7.2 degrees Celsius, so wildly different. And later in the lecture we're going to try to make sense of structurally why this difference. But for right now I want us to just think 
what happens if you change the mass? So what if instead of five grams of copper, we're going to heat up 10 grams of copper? We're gonna input the same amount of heat. Okay, so what would you expect? Would you expect the final temperature to be lower or higher than 98 degrees if we're changing the mass? Take a moment to think about that. And I will tell you, lower. So 59 degrees this time. Bigger mass, the final temperature is lower than if you had a smaller mass. It's only a 39 degrees Celsius um, difference. And lower for water as well, only 23.6 degrees Celsius, which is only a 3.6 degrees Celsius difference. And if you look, you know, we doubled, we times the mass by two, and we're basically dividing the delta T by two. So you can kind of think, what does that mean about the relationship between heat, mass, and change in temperature? I'd like for you to be able to explain the relationship between these variables. Mass, heat transferred, which is Q, delta T, which is degree Celsius, and specific heat. If you want to pause and try to take a moment to write an algebraic rule, in other words, a formula, to calculate how much heat is transferred, go ahead and pause the video now. Otherwise, we'll just keep on rolling. So Q, heat transfer, is related to mass, as we just saw, specific heat, and change in temperature. So. People remember this as like um, MCAT <laughs> if you write it in the in a different order. So you could write M delta T C S and people remember this M. Oh no, C A T. Oh, it is right. I'm so sorry, you guys. M C. This is the fake A T. So MCAT is the a way to remember this formula. Um, Q stands for heat transfer. Unit is joules. M stands for mass. We're talking grams. CS is the specific heat, which is joule per gram times degree Celsius. And delta T is always T final minus T initial. So your final temperature minus the initial temperature. I had mentioned there's um, another set of units for specific heat if it's molar heat capacity. So if we're talking about molar heat capacity rather than mass, we talk about number of moles times the molar heat capacity times the change in temperature. So you should be familiar with both of these formulas. This is molar heat capacity. Okay, so let's think about what's happening at the molecular level. Let's try to develop a kinetic model of heat transfer. And this would be cooler if we had an animation, but all we have to work with is some static pictures, so we'll do our best. Imagine that there's a box that contains neon gas. So each of these red circles are neon atoms at 70 degrees Celsius. And we also have a box coming into contact with the other that has neon at 20 degrees Celsius. So blue just because lower temperature. The question is, in what direction would heat transfer? Okay, let's call this system one and system two. Okay, so imagine how are these particles moving? Think about it. They have a higher temperature. So they're moving much faster. They have more average kinetic energy. They're hitting the walls of the box harder. These neon atoms are moving slower. They have less kinetic energy. They're hitting the walls of the container with less energy. So if you imagine all of these hard-hitting neons coming into contact with these slow-moving neons, the hotter neon particles are going to transfer kinetic energy 
to the slow moving cold neon. So heat transfer is happening in the direction of hot to cold. It always happens, always occurs, hot to cold. And that's because there's more energy, faster moving particles, harder hitting that are going to transfer their energy to the slower moving molecules. So just to summarize, fast moving atoms are going to transfer their kinetic energy to the slow moving atoms. And a question you might ask yourself is, when does this heat transfer stop? When do these hot atoms stop transferring energy to the colder ones? Um, and this picture gives you an idea. Neon at 50 degrees, neon at 50 degrees. So when they come to the same final temperature, we'll say when they reach the same T final, we say th this is at thermal equilibrium. Thermal equilibrium. Okay, so now these particles are moving at the same average speed. They're hitting each other with the same amount of force. There's no more energy transfer to be had. So just to add, fast moving atoms transfer kinetic energy to slow moving atoms until the average kinetic energy of those atoms are the same. And when that's true, we call it thermal equilibrium. Okay, so let's look at this. One question we might ask is does the heat that's coming out of system one equal the heat that's transferred into system two? You might notice 70 to 50, this is only a delta T of 20 degrees, whereas 20 to 50, that's a delta T of 30 degrees. So is energy conserved in this, um, in this process? So we could use the formula up here that we just derived to do some calculations. So if we wanted to ask about the heat out of system one, okay, we'd set up Q equals MCS delta T. Uh, I'm just going to use kind of some arbitrary numbers here. I'm going to pretend or assume that each one of these um, particles is going to represent a gram. So I'm going to call this six grams of neon and one, two, three, four, call this four grams of neon. So six grams, the specific heat capacity of neon is, hang on, sorry you guys, my computer froze. I have to make sure this is still going. I think it is. Um, okay. So the heat out, yes, heat capacity is 0 0.904 joules per gram times degree Celsius. And I'm going to say T final minus T initial. So T final is 50 degrees. Minus 70 degrees was the initial. So if you do that calculation, you'll actually find it's a negative number. It's negative 108 approximately um, joules. I'm not really paying attention to sig figs for this. This is just an estimate. And what does that negative mean? That negative tells you that um, heat is coming out of the system. Okay, That's a convention that you're going to have to get familiar with. If we did this calculation for system two, the heat in to system two, Q equals MCS delta T. So Q equals now four grams times the same specific heat because we're talking about neon, times 
50 minus 20. 50 degrees Celsius minus 20 degrees Celsius. This time you'll notice delta T is a positive number. So positive 108 approximately um, joules. So a positive in thermochem denotes heat in. So that's just saying the, the exact amount of heat that was transferred out of system one was transferred into system two. So energy is conserved. Uh, I'm going to summarize that here. Conservation of energy is a big idea for us in this unit. And you're going to know notice that anytime heat's being transferred, the heat lost by one unit is gained by the net the thing that's coming into contact with it. So often we use the word of, you know, system or surroundings. The heat lost by the system is gained by the surroundings. And this is going to help us when it comes to calculating heat transfer. Okay, so we still haven't at a structural level answered the question of why is it that things have different heat capacities? Why do substances have different heat capacities? What's going on there? And of course we're chemists and so we're going to go to the molecular level. Um, and one thing that is true is that whenever you transfer heat into a substance, be it copper, water, or anything, heat transfer increases the motions of the particles. Okay, so heat transfer increases the motions of particles. Okay, now we haven't yet talked about what kinds of motions are possible because when we did gases, we were just imagining, right, gas A is a circle, gas B is a circle. We were kind of modeling things for, um, for atoms, but molecules actually have lots of different internal motions that we have to think about. So heat transfer can increase motions of particles and four molecules... There's actually three different kinds of motions that they can undergo. And I had meant to bring a model kit with me, but I don't have one. So we'll do our best with my hands. So translational motion, okay? Let's imagine that, uh, hmm, I guess that this is a molecule. Translational motion is movement across space, okay? So when heat is transferred, there's more motions. They're moving faster across space. This we're familiar with. So translational motion is um, movement across space. Okay, rotation, as it sounds, is that the whole molecule is rotating. And you're kind of imagining it rotating across a fixed point. So if the thing was moving and um, traveling over space, it would be doing rotational and translational. But rotational motion is just rotation um, around a fixed point. Okay, and vibrational motion, this is where a model kit would have been really helpful. But no model kit. Imagine that these are two atoms. We'll go like this, bonded together. The bond's invisible. The vibrational motion is like this. The two atoms are vibrating back and forth. Or I don't think that I can really show this, but in the case of water, if you imagine this being two H's and one O, the bonds will do this. There's kind of like this wag that's happening. Um, so these arrows are showing 
two atoms coming together, the bond gets shorter, and then the bond stretches, and then it gets shorter, and then it stretches. So vibrations uh, occur for bonded atoms in a molecule um, that oscillate, which is that back and forth motion, around a fixed point. Okay, and the thing to note is that if you, if heat is transferred and it creates more vibrations or more rotations, vibrational and rotational motions do not result, okay, do not result in any kind of temperature change. It is only, I'm going to see if this works, only translational motion, increasing translational motion results in a temperature change. Mm -hmm. So key note right here, the big idea is that delta T, temperature change of a substance, depends only on translational motion. Okay, so what does that mean? If you have molecules that are bigger and that have more bonds, they're going to lose more energy to vibrational motion and require more energy to change their temperature. We can come back now to um, the example that we started with, looking at water and copper, right? Say you are heating water on a stove in a copper pot. Why is it that the copper heats up so much faster than the water? Or another way of saying that is why does water have a higher specific heat and something like copper that's metallic would have a lower specific heat? Why? And the answer lies in molecular motion. Okay, so if you think about water, Water molecules can move across space, so they have translational motion. Okay, water molecules, they can rotate, they can spin, so they have rotational. And they're bonded atoms, right? This H can get closer to the O and further away, so the bond can shorten, the bond can stretch. So they also have vibrational motion. Whereas metallic copper, we're imagining copper, right, as um, copper two plus um, ions, or one plus, um, in a sea of electrons, so in a sea of negative charge. And really, this is just a point charge, a positive point charge. So we never talk about these atoms rotating because they're, they're spherical. There's, um, I don't know, I always have trouble kind of explaining this, but um, there's not multiple atoms on it that, are, that have some kind of rotational energy. They're just spheres. So even if the sphere is rotating, it doesn't count as rotation around a fixed point. Um, and Copper atoms are not bonded covalently. So when they oscillate, we actually think about it as translational motion because for ionic and metallic substances, once the at atoms or ions start moving, um, they're moving across space. They're not oscillating across a fixed point like the molecules do. Okay? So the takeaway, I don't know if any of that was coherent, but the takeaway is that for metallic and ionic substances, the only possible motions are translational. That's it. So now take a moment, guys, and think about how could you write a molecular level explanation here? Why does water require more heat to change its temperature 
than a copper pot? How could you explain in terms of motions? Pause the video. Take a moment to construct an explanation. Okay, I'm hoping you did. Um, one way to kind of talk about this is that for water, let's say you're transferring in the same amount of heat, we're putting one joule into water versus one joule into copper. In water, heat transfer is going to be lost to rotational and vibrational motion. So there's going to be heat transferred in that goes into rotating the molecules, vibrating the molecules, and translating the molecules. But only translational motion increases the temperature. So you're going to have a much smaller temperature change here as opposed to the copper atoms, all of the heat that's transferred in goes into translating those molecules faster and therefore increasing their temperature more. So in water, heat transfer results in increasing vibrational and rotational motion in addition to increasing translational okay mm -hmm. therefore um, heat is uh, lost two motions that do not result in, let's say, increasing or decreasing T, the temperature. Whereas in copper, all heat transferred goes into increasing translational motion. Okay, so bigger delta T's in copper, smaller specific heat. Okay, before we move on, I want to be clear about our terms. We've kind of started to use this term system. We've talked about heat transfer and energy and temperature, but I want to make sure that we define our terms before we continue. So, temperature. You already know the definition of this, but we just kind of modified it by talking about the kinds of motion that matters, right? Only translational motion results in a temperature change. So when you think of temperature now, we're going to talk about it as the measure of the average translational kinetic energy. So it's a measure of the average translational kinetic energy of, let's say, the molecules or atoms or ions, whatever you're talking about, in a sample. Okay, translational kinetic energy. Now, thermal energy, while temperature is just a measure of the average translational kinetic energy, thermal energy is adding up the total internal kinetic energy in a sample. So it's the total, I'm going to underline that, total internal kinetic energy, so not an average, but you're adding up all the internal kinetic energy um, of a sample due to its random translational, rotational, and vibrational motions. Okay, so Due to random motions of molecules or, you know, atoms and ions. But I'm putting molecules because they do all of them. So vibrational, rotational, 
and translational. Okay, so thermal energy is really just a kinetic, a kind of kinetic energy, a total kinetic energy, and it takes into account all the different ways that molecules are moving. Now, heat, the actual definition of heat is that it's a spontaneous transfer of thermal energy. The spontaneous, let me pick a new color. Okay, oh, and from high temp to low temp. Okay, and we already kind of looked at that, right? This process of heat transfer, all of these atoms are moving in a certain way, and they're spontaneously colliding with these slower moving atoms and transferring kinetic energy. Always hot to cold. So, you know, we talk about heat sometimes like a noun, like the object has heat, but actually heat is a verb in thermochem. It's a process, not a thing. Okay, moving on to some calculations. So taking all those ideas that we've developed so far, conservation of, ener of energy being probably the most important, um, and, and heat transfer. We're going to think through this problem. A 32.5 gram cube, here it is, of aluminum, initially at 45.8 degrees Celsius, is submerged into 105.3 grams of water at 15.4 degrees Celsius. The question is, what is the final temperature of both substances? One thing you might ask yourself, right, are both substances going to be the same temperature at the end? And if you had any questions, you could come back here. We're putting hot metal in contact with cooler water. They're gonna tr the metal is going to transfer heat to the water until both the water and the metal reach thermal equilibrium and have the same final temperature. So that's kind of nice to know. When you're working with heat transfer, um, it's important to uh, tr basically define the system under investigation. So I'm just going to put here, if you're going to track energy change, energy changes, you need to define the system under investigation. You can really define the system as you want. Um, I'm just going to pick aluminum to be our system. I'm going to say that's the thing that we care about, tracking aluminum. Then we said everything else is the surroundings. In these problems, though, they're kind of artificial. We're going to assume that only water, that all of the heat lost from the aluminum is going to be transferred into the water. So even though the surroundings would be, you know, the water, the beaker, you can think about other things, maybe the air, we're going to assume for the sake of most of the problems that we solve that it's just the water. And uh, when you do thermochem experiments, you'll actually be doing them in an insulated styrofoam cup, so that will help kind of um, keep heat from transferring to other places. Okay, so the big idea, whenever you have a thermochem problem, you have to ask yourself, how is energy conserved? Okay. Think about your Q's, Q being the variable for heat. You have the system being aluminum, so the heat lost, that's why a negative, heat lost from aluminum 
is going to equal the heat gained by the water. We developed this idea again here. The heat lost from system one was gained by system two, right? Heat loss is equal to heat gain. This is an important concept that you'll take with you throughout the whole unit. Okay, so this is gonna help us set up our problem mathematically. I kinda wish I would've written it in the middle, so I'm just gonna uh, write down now, we know what Q equals, right? Q, and I'm putting my negative on the outside of my quantity, Q is the mass of aluminum times the specific heat of aluminum times the change in temperature that aluminum undergoes. And we're gonna say that that will be equal to the positive quantity, mass of water, times specific heat of water, times delta T of water. And the problem wants us to um, solve for T final, but it's actually often easier, or easy is not the right word, more straightforward to keep the delta T's as delta T's and solve for one of them Solve for either delta T aluminum or delta T water. Um, and once you do that, then to plug in T initial, T final. So for now, you're just going to plug in what you know, what was given to you in the problem. We know both the mass of aluminum and water. We know the specific heat they were given to us here of aluminum and water. Um, so let's plug those in and keep delta T's as they are for now. Okay, so negative 32.5 grams times 0 0.903 joules per gram times degree Celsius times delta T of aluminum should equal the mass of the water, 105.3 grams. I guess I don't need this parenthesis anymore. 105.3 grams times the specific heat for water, 4.18 joules per gram time degree Celsius times delta T. You can look at what units cancel, okay? Grams are canceling in both cases. And once we input our delta T's, Celsius will cancel. So our heats will be left in units of joules. Okay, so what you wanna do for right now, multiply these two terms together on both sides and solve for delta T. I'm gonna solve for delta T of aluminum. I just am randomly deciding that. So I multiply these numbers together, I get negative 29.35 and the unit J joules per degree Celsius. Now keep this whole value in your calculator. I'm just going to mark that we should have three sig figs times delta T. Okay, multiply these two terms together and you should get 440.1, sorry, I'm just checking to make sure my computer is battery. Okay, 40.0, 440.15, sorry guys, joules per degree Celsius times delta T water. Since I'm going to solve for delta T aluminum, we're going to divide both sides by negative 29.35, so that goes. And if you divide this by negative 29.35 joules per degree Celsius, you'll see the units cancel, and what you end up with is negative 14.99, again, marking three sig figs, delta T H2O, equals delta T AL. Okay, stop here. Oh, I'm so sorry. There it is. Okay, 
ask yourself, what does this mean? First of all, there's a negative over here, okay? So that should mean that water is not changing temperature as fast as aluminum is. And this number is almost 15. So the temperature of water times 15 gives us the temp of aluminum. So what does this mean? This tells us that aluminum changes temperature or, yeah, changes temp. 15 times more than water. Okay, I think I said something wrong. This negative means that the delta T, that aluminum is losing more than 15 times the temperature of water. So water is going to increase in temperature and the aluminum is going to decrease. Okay, but the problem asked for T final. So here's where you want to plug back in the T final of aluminum minus T initial of aluminum, and then negative 14.99 times T final of water minus T initial. Now the thing to note is that the T final is going to be the same for both. So you only have to pay attention to the initial. T final minus, let's see, aluminum is initially at 45.8. Mm -hmm. And negative 14.99. T final is going to be the same. And then T initial was 15.4. Okay, we're getting closer. You're going to have to distribute this 14.99 to both terms. Minus, when you do that, you should get 230.97 degrees Celsius. 3 sig figs, 3 sig figs, so 3 sig figs, just keeping track along the way. But remember, you're trying to keep the whole number in your calculator. Okay, we are so close. I'm going to subtract the T final to the left side of the equation, and I'm going to add 45.8 to the right side of the equation. So I'm going to add 45.8 degrees Celsius to this term and I'm going to subtract 14.99 TF to this side. So when I add 14 I should get 15.99 TF. Okay and when I add the 48.8 I got 276.77. Oh Okay, sorry guys. When you distribute a negative to here, that changed the sign positive. So we're making this number bigger now. 276.97. Nope, 77. Seven. Oh my goodness. Okay. Yes, degrees Celsius. So then very last step is to divide 15.99. So TF is going to equal 17.30 degrees Celsius. And here's where I better think about sig figs. 230, so I had 3 here. And we had then 3 in the final. So 17.3 degrees Celsius. Woo! Okay. There are some tro problems like this that you can practice if you want more help setting it up or working with the algebra. Okay, this is the very last point we're going to make. This kind of gets back to the demo that we started with. Why is it that the air, or in this case we're going to talk about 
gaseous water. But why is it that the air had a lower specific heat, was able to heat up so much faster and then break the rubber than the water? Okay, and take a moment and just think through what are the possible motions liquid water and gaseous water can participate in? Turns out, all. By all, I mean rotational, vibrational, and translational. Okay, that's, that's the same for both. So before we made an argument, you know, for water and copper that was based on, oh, there's more motions that heat can be transferred into. But now the motions are controlled for. So think really hard. What is the main difference between liquid water, these molecules are super close to each other, right? Think about how they're interacting. Versus gaseous water, the molecules are super spread out. So take a moment. Why would transferring the same amount of heat to liquid water and gaseous water lead to a much smaller temperature change for liquid water? Pause the video. Construct a molecular level explanation. And hopefully you did that. The main difference here is IMFs. Okay, so think about gaseous water, there's no hydrogen bonding really that's happening, they're too far spread out, but in liquid water you have hydrogen bonds. So if you're putting heat in, and some energy is going to be lost to breaking the hydrogen bonds in water. So in liquid, energy is lost to breaking hydrogen bonds. Okay, and I'm not talking about boiling here. I'm just talking about heating up a cup of liquid. So you're constantly breaking and reforming hydrogen bonds, but there is energy lost in the breaking. By contrast, gaseous water They're too far apart. It's a hydrogen bond. So more energy in the gas goes into increasing translational motion. Whew. Okay. So go back to the learning objectives, right? You can now to explain the difference between heat and temperature. You know what's happening at a temperature scale or at an atomic scale. You know how Q relates to mass, the specific heat, and the change in temperature of a substance. And you know how to explain CS in terms of molecular motions. The other thing I would add on here is conservation of energy. Um, and I told you at the start that we would come back to this chart, okay? So the first law of thermodynamics says that energy is conserved. And what that means for us is that any time heat is lost from a system, okay, where is that heat going? To the surroundings. It's gained by the surroundings. Now, I don't want this to be, the, this isn't the only direction it can go. I probably should have left more room, but you could have the system gaining energy from the surroundings. The big idea is that the Qs are the same. One's positive, one's negative, but the quantity is the same. Okay, so where are we at? We're going to talk about exothermic and endothermic next lecture. But right now, we've talked about heat transfer that results in a temperature change. So anytime there's a delta T from your heat transfer, Q equals MCS delta T, mat, or Q equals moles times CP times delta T. All right.
Thanks for hanging in with me, and I'll see you in lab.